Hey guys, Morg here. So I got a question from Cassie who essentially said, you know, I'm not very good at math. Do I have to be good at math to understand Hyperionism? Now, right away, I want to say the answer to that question is no, you don't. Now, I know why you may think this and why many people may think this, and that's because Hyperionism shows that this reality is a shared mathematical dream. It's not a physical reality, it's a mental reality as defined through mathematics, mathematical sinusoidal waveforms. So many people come to Hyperionism and they think, do I have to be a world-class mathematician to be able to understand this? Uh, no, of course not. If you are, that's awesome, but you don't have to be. There are many intuitive ways to come to an understanding of Hyperionism. Now I'm going to explain some of the mathematical foundations of Hyperionism. Now don't let this scare you away, this is just so that I can lay down the foundation and the groundwork to show you how you can understand these concepts intuitively without the need for hardcore mathematics. Hyperionism says this is not a material reality, that this is a mathematical reality of mind. In philosophy, this is known as idealism. Idealism coming from the word idea and relating to thought and the mind. Now, the first modern philosopher, René Descartes, wasn't a materialist or an idealist. He was a dualist. He said that there was both matter and mind and that they interacted with each other. A big problem that has been plaguing philosophy and thought in general is what's known as the problem of substance dualism. And that is if you have two distinct substances such as mind and matter and if they share nothing in common with each other then how can they possibly interact? Two things cannot interact unless they share a common property or else there's no bridge between them. There's no way that something mental and unextended could interact with something material and extended. They share no common properties. So if there are two distinct substances, it's impossible for them to interact. This is the fatal flaw of dualism and this split philosophy into two camps. Those that were materialists and said that all that can possibly exist is matter and those that were idealists and said that all that can possibly exist is mind. Hyperionism is an idealist philosophy, which means that all of reality is mind. In the case of Hyperionism, mind is defined as mathematical waveforms. Through our system of ontological mathematics, we can solve the problem of substance dualism. Now remember, I'm going to get into some of the mathematics here, but in a moment I'm going to explain how this can be understood intuitively. Now how mind and matter can interact is through Fourier mathematics. In Fourier mathematics there are two domains, the frequency domain and the space-time domain. The frequency domain is composed of basis waves and the space-time domain is composed of the additive result of those waves. So it's two different ways of looking at the same information. On one hand you have pure frequencies and then on the other you have the additive result of those frequencies. Again, this is two different ways of looking at the same information. You can't have the space-time domain without the frequency domain because the space-time domain is made up from the basis waves of the frequency domain. Now, in Hyperionism and ontological mathematics, this is how we solve the problem of substance dualism because the frequency domain is the domain of mind, what we call the source. And the space-time domain is the domain of matter, what we call the holos. Now you see, it's not two different substances, it's two different ways of looking at the same substance. If you're looking at it from one side, at the space-time side, you're looking at the world of everyday objects, the space-time world that you exist in today. And then if you flip to the other side, the frequency domain, this is the domain of pure mind. So there is no interaction problem because they're not really two different substances. The space-time domain relies on the frequency domain to exist. If you took away the frequency domain, then the space-time domain would cease to exist. 
It's two different ways of looking at the same information. Mind, the frequency domain, gives rise to so-called matter, but it's not actually matter at all because it depends on mind for its existence. It arises from mind. It's the additive result of mind. It's the combination of thought forms that form the material realm all around you. Now, the great thing about this is that you can understand this all intuitively, and a great way to understand it intuitively is through music. Imagine a piano. The keys are like the individual frequencies. The keys and the piano is like the source, the mental realm. But what happens when you start to play the piano? You start combining frequencies and creating a song. The combined frequencies and the song is the space-time domain, the holos. So you can see the piano is the source because you couldn't have the song without the piano. The song is reliant on the piano. The piano is the source of the song. And the piano, the source, contains all the individual components, all the individual keys, all the individual frequencies. And when you start to play the piano, you start to combine the frequencies together to create the song. And you see, once again, it's not two different things, it's two different ways of looking at the same information. So this reality can actually be thought of as a cosmic song, a cosmic symphony. The great philosopher Pythagoras, the first person to understand that this reality is a mathematical reality, actually said, there is geometry in the humming of the strings. There is music in the spacing of the spheres. This existence is a cosmic song that we are all creating together. We are all individual minds, known as monads. And what is a monad? A monad is a Fourier frequency domain. A monad is a set of all possible frequencies. So I contain a set of all possible frequencies, and so do you, and so does everyone else. And as we combine our thoughts together, that is the generation of the space-time holos, this existence that we exist in together because this is a collective mathematical dream, a Fourier space-time projection. Now, once again, to understand this intuitively, think in terms of music. Think of each individual monad as an individual single piano. So I am continuously playing my piano, and so are you, and so is everyone else. And the additive result of all of our piano playing together creates the cosmic song of existence. Each one of us is an individual piano, but taken together, all of our frequencies played together creates the song of existence. And this is how you can intuitively begin to understand our system of ontological mathematics. This is a collective shared dream space. Each one of us is a monad, which is a complete and total collection of all possible frequencies. And this domain that we exist in together is the additive result of all those frequencies when taken together. And this is why it's so important for us to all work together, because when we're playing in tune, we create a beautiful symphony. But when everyone's just working on their own damn song and doesn't give a fuck about anyone else, it just creates chaotic noise, just pure and total dissonance. That's why the earth is the hell that it is now. Instead of people playing a tune together to create amazing music, everyone is just banging on trash cans. Look at people like Trump, it's just noise. But when we work together and build each other up, this is like creating a better and better song. So when you look at the fact that reality is frequency patterns, you can see that it's quite literally a cosmic symphony. Reality is a cosmic song that we're all creating together. And the world must wake up to that fact and realize it 
so that we can create a better world together. What's amazing about all this is this is not speculation. Ontological mathematics proves that this is a mathematical reality. And if you want to begin to understand this, then start off with these two great books, Ontological Mathematics, The Science of the Future, which I wrote, and Ontological Mathematics for the Curious, An Introduction to Ontological Thinking by Dr. Cody Newman. These are the two best books to get you started in learning ontological mathematics. But again, this is for those that want to understand it mathematically. We have the mathematics for those that want to know. Intuitively speaking, the best way to learn is through the videos that we offer here and the books on IamHyperion.com. And again, for those that are a bit daunted by the mathematics and more intuitive, start off with our video series on inner star actualization, which is all about actualizing your higher self, understanding your mirror self, your shadow self, your power self, your higher self, and actualizing your inner potential and bringing it forth to the world. We have an awesome video series that I'll link to. Check out the playlist, it's very good. What's really important to understand about learning ontological mathematics is that you don't have to be good at large calculations. You don't have to know what 500,000 times 293 is and be able to calculate it like that. Being able to do calculations quickly and things like that is not important. What is important is understanding the underlying concepts. The philosophy behind it, which is a lot different. You don't need to be a calculator, you just need to be able to understand the big concepts that underlie this way of thinking. And this is outside of the possibility for most of humanity. Most humans can't get past the idea that this reality is material. That's what they all think. So if you're one of the few that has the capacity to understand that this is a mental reality, a mathematical reality, then you're already beyond the cognitive capacity of most of humanity. You're one of the very few that's in the cutting edge, that's on the forefront of a new way of thinking and a new paradigm. So be proud of that. I get a lot of Hyperians that are kind of down on themselves because they think, oh, I'm not that smart. I could never be that smart. If you are part of this movement, you are incredibly intelligent and already are at the pinnacle of thought in the current consciousness of this world. You are pushing the boundaries. You are at the forefront. So don't be down on yourself. Be proud of yourself. This is a difficult way of thinking. And if you can already begin to grasp the information that we're talking about at any capacity, if you're involved with us at all, then you are already vastly more intelligent than the majority of humanity. Make sure that you like and subscribe right now. Also, this question was brought to me by someone on Patreon. So if you support on Patreon, you can ask questions and I might actually answer them in one of these videos. If you support our work and what we're doing, become a supporter on Patreon so we can continue to create videos, hold events, make material, and do so much to create a new world. So become a supporter on Patreon today. Help us move forward. And for those of you who are supporters already, thank you. You guys are awesome. My name is Morg, and I am Hyperion. Hail, New Terra.